Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, today's uh, session's title is Best Practices in uh, PEAT Programs. And we have an amazing uh, set of speakers to talk about it. Uh, you're, as a host, uh, I'm Dr. Fahim Hussein. I'm a professor in the School of Future of Innovation in Society uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, so today, we are actually going to talk about some disconnects. Some disconnects about within PEAT and disconnects among uh, the students or the potential students of public interest technology. Because sometimes what we have seen is that many people look into PIT as just a technology and not focuses on the other societal and humanitarian aspects of it. It does not talk about the adaptation of human-centered design. We don't talk about product development. We don't talk about engineering, re-engineering, and also how it actually involves iterative process, how it includes people. So here, to this, uh, our different speakers, what we are going to do is we are trying to, we're going to focus on some of the philosophical uh, and uh, equitable and socio-religious aspects of it. Um, and uh, we have an amazing set of speakers. I will first introduce uh, them to you. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Alexandrina Agloro. Um, she's a professor in the School of Future of Innovation in Society, Arizona State University. Then we have uh, Professor Elizabeth Graffin, uh, Professor of Practice in the SFIS ASU. Then we have uh, Ms. Jumana Abogazale. She's the president of the Pivot for Humanity, uh, an organization uh, that works uh, since 2018. Uh, and uh, then we have with us uh, momentarily, I guess, uh, Professor uh, Eric Fisher will join us. We're still waiting on him. And we also have Professor Robert Kubdigan. He is the professor in the School of Future of Innovation in Society as well. So I will first um, start the conversation with uh, uh, Professor Alexandra Gloro. And her specialty is as a media artist, as a community-based researcher. And she also believes in the possibilities of decolonial imaginary uh, when it comes to using ancestral technologies as liberatory tools. So the first question I have for you is, when we talk about, when we imagine heat, when we talk about public interest technology, uh, how do we contend with the inherent racial biases that kind of is, uh, you know, we can see in our system. How, how do you see that? How do you address it? Oh, I was also muted. <laughs> um, I get to open this up and I just, um, though this is a digital convening, we're all located on native land somewhere. Um, so I greet you from the traditional lands of the Otham, the Yavapai, the Maricopa people. And I understand that it's not enough to give land acknowledgements and real changes indigenous land repatriation. Um, and I strongly believe that public interest technology can play a role in this kind of liberation. And so when we're talking about um, bias in pit systems, um, I'm gonna tell a little story. Uh, I was speaking with another ASU professor uh, just yesterday about the first cohort of native students to go to ASU. And they had come straight from the Navajo reservation and they had no experience living in the city. A few of them were homeless. They slept under the bleachers because it just wasn't, it wasn't just college life that they were unprepared for. It was an entire culture and system and lifestyle shift that they weren't yet ready because they had no prior experience in this system. And so I'm telling you this story because it's also what's going on in our current tech systems. So when we talk about bias, I guess I'm talking about like education and curricula. Um, I want to start even before we get into the classrooms because there are students, particularly young people of color, who never even make it into the classroom. Um, so how do we combat this bias? So we have to think about things like intimidation and advantages, um, what it means to get into classrooms, um, whether or not they feel welcome once they get into these classrooms. Um, when we think about careers, thinking about uh, who who's at home, and in general, young people think about um, they be they want to their options of who they can be 
in the world is based on who they see in their families at home and then what they see in the media. So like you can't be what you can't see. So they don't see people who look like them. And then that possibility is harder to imagine. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll do a curricula one and then I'll stop and we can keep going. Um, when thinking about curricula, like we want to think as educators. So if we're combating bias in some way, um, think about your syllabi. Like, who are your students reading? And at bare minimum, do you have women on your syllabus? Do you have people of color on your syllabus? Do you have queer people on your syllabus? Do you have trans people on your syllabus? Um, and it's also important how we represent that, like how we represent who's in our syllabi. Uh, you should have everybody, authors of like diverse authors should be woven into core concepts in your courses. Um, they shouldn't be siloed into these race days, the gender day, um, as if outside of special interest topics, women and people of color don't exist. Um, and then we, can we talk about women, people of color, queer people and technology without positioning them in this deficit or damage based position? So not, not always talking about this is what's wrong. These people don't have this thing. Um, so I guess I ask, can we have full color conversations that depict the world as it is instead of that narrow slice that we currently just see? Okay, Fahim, back to you. Thank you so much for your thoughts. So you actually uh, started to answer one of my follow-up questions, which is, uh, and I think we, we will come back to it, but uh, just quickly, I wanted to ask you, so when we, we, when we, one thing is to recognize it, and then the other thing is how we move forward, how we make it more equitable, so, um, and you started talking about it, that are we doing this? So we are raising the questions. Uh, so, but before uh, we move on to our next speaker on a, on a, on a similar topic, uh, uh, do you, would you like to add something in terms of how should we make it more equitable uh, or how you foresee so that, because in many cases, for, for example, in, in, within ASU, we are just starting, we have just started the program. So what are the things we can do? Um, so I like this phrasing that disability activists um, use, and they say nothing about us without us. And so when thinking about design, so taking it on from even a technological design perspective, um, do not create things for people to help them. You want to co-design with people, teach skills that enable diverse shareholders to take charge of issues that most affect their own communities. So like when we think about these words like, we're giving voice or we're empowering, we're doing all of these things. And I'm sure these like words come up, like especially in a relatively new pit space. I would say, don't do those things. Give skills to people, teach the skill so that you're actually not needed. If you can step back from the world that you are in and they can carry on without you, then you've totally done your job. Like to move away from that system or to move away and to not be needed is exactly what I think how we can make our systems more equitable, teach skills, and move on and let people use those skills, don't be needed. And then last, diverse from unequal structures of power, which I know is really hard because we're all coming from fancy places with fancy degrees and like fancy educations and fancy jobs. Um, but being equitable means that we might get a little bit less so that everybody can have a little bit more and be ready for that if you really mean it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We need to be ready for that. And I will come back to you with some specific uh, uh, follow-up questions, and I'm pretty sure uh, the listeners will have some follow-up as well. So um, I'll go to our next uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Jumana Abu Ghazali. She is um, a doer. She is the president of the Pivot for Humanity, uh, who she founded in 2018. Uh, and the, the whole idea of this organization, which I find fascinating, it's uh, to work towards a data-driven social tech industry and foster a responsible, ethical, and accountable internet. How do we do this? How do we do accountable internet and also serve the humanity? Um, that's, that's, that's my question, but not for this session, but eventually I think, eventually I think you will come, you will address it. So uh, Juvana, um, what I would start with is um, you as a practitioner, you look into the industry and you, you are striving to make it more ethical. So what do you think? How should we teach ethical codes of conduct and principles in STEM uh, within the PIT curriculum? Uh, 
what 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 are the what are the what needs to happen? What needs to connect the dots and the graph be between the theories and the practices? Uh, you are muted. Okay, now everybody else has to do it because it's a pattern. Okay, Elizabeth okay. and Bob. We all start talking on mute and then we can all. Um, thank you so much. I'm uh, thrilled to be here and uh, really humbled by the panelists. Um, you know, before we started, he asked if he should address me as doctor. And I said, no, I'm just regular old Jumana. I don't have uh, your um, qualifications and expertise. So bear with me as I bring this sort of outside perspective, outside of academia. But, um, um, I wanted to say, so how do, how should we teach codes of ethics in um, STEM? And I think that I would start by taking a step back and saying, how are we teaching STEM in the first place? Um, because, uh, you know, we think of STEM disciplines uh, typically as sort of objective, rational, um, empirical sort of uh, cerebral disciplines when in fact in 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 the real world in application they're not um they can get quite messy and so that's you know there is bias in in all of them for example so um they're anything but objective and empirical and one of the things i think it's really important is to say are we are we grounding students of stem in the idea that these are applied sciences, that they're not sort of just theories, but things that actually are forming the actual building blocks, digital infrastructure of society. So these aren't in just concepts um, and, and um, you know, things to learn, but they're actually going to be um, part of how these students go out into the world and what they build and what they do. So one of the things I would say is, um, we shouldn't think about sort of ethics in STEM, but the ethics of STEM. So not as an additive sort of extraneous thing that we bring into the discipline, but that's something that's embedded in it, that's innate, that's part of the process. Um, and to do that, I'd say we need to, you know, first define what that is as a whole. So what is STEM? What is STEM's role in uh, in society, and how does how do we think about the ethical consequences and ethical implications of it? Um, and importantly, I'd say in terms of education, I'd say it has to be uh, a clear understanding of what ethics means in the context of STEM, of the ethics of STEM, but also um, quasi universal definition, so that from institution to institution, from academic organization to academic organization, the general framing is the same. Because if it differs in different institutions, um, you, you know, you're gonna have a patchwork of uh, ideas about what's right and what's wrong. And then you asked about sort of the, the, how do we connect the dots from that theory, from that environment, academic environment, where your students are learning and getting grounded in the context of ethics to practice. And I think that there, that happens in essentially two ways. One is we need to um, re rehumanize the data. Um, I mean, we're so enamored with big data right now. And, you know, Alex just mentioned the, you know, nothing about us without us, but we tend to see as big data as having all the answers as, um, you know, the kind of stuff that like numbers don't lie, that kind of thing. And, and taking that as, as gospel where, um, there's a real truth that data, big data also obfuscates, it obscures, it makes us as individuals in, invisible, it hides our humanity, it makes us, um, it dulls everyone into sort of a number, so, and, and so people actually disappear. And so one of the things I think is really important is to rehumanize the data, and you can do that with students by making it personal. By, by helping them, for example, to say, if um, whenever they're thinking about a problem or a process is um, not just who is it for, but what if this is going to be used by somebody you really care and worry about on the one hand and somebody you, you fear, somebody who you think is very dangerous on the other, and what if both people use it at the same time? What would you do differently? How would you think about creating this thing differently? 
Um, so that's on the one hand is like expanding the personas and making them personal so that when we are creating things, we know that these are eventually things that the entire world, we want the entire world to use. So what does that look like? Um, and second, you know, if we really want ethics in practice, um, I think it has to be, a, you know, it has to switch from being something that is aspirational, something that's nice to have to something that's required. So, you know, like, like it is with um, professions, it's a must have, you know, you're duty bound to practice ethical behavior. If we just sort of, if students just graduate with this understanding of what's right and wrong and go to, into the workforce and have no way, no power to enforce this understanding, to apply this learning, um, where you know we're, we find ourselves at ground zero, all the education didn't matter. It didn't help that they were trained that way. They have to have the power to say, um, I need to apply my, these ethical standards in my work, even though, and even if the corporate values or the structure that I'm entering doesn't support it. So, you know, a profession, professionals are duty bound. And, and uh, I think if we ever want ethical practices in STEM, we have to make them required, not desired. So what what we are uh, actually what I'm getting from this conversation is um, that uh, it's uh, it's just not uh, a tick box. We have to actually walk the talk, and we have to include those things um, as we mean it. And I have some follow up, uh, more uh, more practical uh, questions for you. I will come back to you related with how the young practitioners in Kate, um can actually include that not just in their curriculum but right after they're actually in the industry. Uh, I'll come back to you, Jumana. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, our next speaker uh, would be, um, let me see. Oh, our next speaker is the Professor of Practice, uh, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Graffi of School of Future of Innovation and Society. And uh, she um, is focusing on issues related with uh, disruptive changes at the intersection of science, politics, and culture. Um, her research explores and experiments with energy innovations that enhance uh, that, that enhance uh, social sustainability and resilience. Uh, and she has advised and worked with numerous uh, NGOs and academic and governmental organizations. So, uh, Professor uh, Graffi, uh, I have uh, the first question I have for you is: uh, If you look back, like your years of federal policy experience. Now, what capacity would you think that you want the PID graduates uh, to have if they would like to work in the policy area? Uh, what kind of curriculum we need to provide them so that people who are interested in PID uh, and policy um, can they, sh they should take it? So what can we do about it? And what, how do you see those uh, disconnections or the those need are met? Okay, I'm going to break the uh, trend and I'm going to unmute myself from the start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we go. We all learn technology. We share our knowledge with each other, right? <laughs> um, I thank you for that introduction. And um, I, I, it's really difficult to not just respond to the people that have already spoken, you know, before each of us, because the conversation seems to want to get going. Uh, let me just address your question, Fahim, in a couple of different ways. Um, and first, put it in context. When I was in the federal government, which I was for almost two decades, I um, was a national policy advisor for a lot of that time, partly in the executive branch, uh, well, initially in Congress uh, and working with folks around the country and in the executive branch, and then in the executive branch, um, working in science agencies with policymakers. And so that gives me a particular um, perspective. And so one of the experiences that I had in that, and I have to say that, that these experiences have been um, also reflected a little bit in my teaching at ASU over the last 10 years, um, is that there's a tendency for people that have technical degrees to arrive in the policy process believing that their purpose is to shed rational light on the issues before policymakers. 
and that the main knowledge that they need to have is their technical knowledge and that somehow or other that has a linear you know pipeline sort of relationship into the decision making process and it's actually not true that's not really how it works and so one of the first capacities that i think any pit students who are interested in working in, in policy spaces regardless of what level those policy spaces may be would be to have an authentic and deep under understanding of the institutional arrangements within which decision making occur and that means um, not just understanding the rules uh, and, and not just understanding that there's a thing called politics but understanding them as systems that are um, as technology rich although there are social technologies as opposed to physical technologies as anything that they have that they may have learned in their stem disciplines so uh, one i think is to develop a, a really authentic you know, we use that word transdisciplinary a lot, but I think that, that there is a kind of an integrated holistic sort of a view that people really need to um, um, uh, learn and embrace. And it's really, uh, it's not typically taught. Um, so one of the challenges for PIP curricula uh, would be to figure out how to do that in a really solid way so that people come out with mastery of the whole system, not just the, the technical discipline. So, um, another way of thinking about that is that PIT is not a way of softening STEM disciplines, right? So PIT is not, um, I think, in the ideal for engineers who want to learn about society or, or policy. PIT is, I think, a signal. It's a way of reclaiming the idea of technology as being a, a, a public thing, a public phenomenon, a social phenomenon that has multiple facets. So. What do we, what does that mean? Well, technology isn't just something that, you know, Apple designs, right? Um, I mean, technology occurs in all sectors, public and private and hybrid sectors. It occurs um, within and among different kinds of disciplines that each have their own sort of ethical premises, that each have their own ways of thinking about um, how you plan and design, they each have their own ways of thinking about risks, that have their own ways of, you know, thinking about who publics are and that in a lot of ways are governed by different policies and laws about what rights those sorts of, um, let's call them the, the non-traditionally co-designers in, in, in the public or people with a public interest uh, might, um, might have, what, what roles they may have, what rights they may have to get involved in the processes of technology development to begin with, or even determining what counts as technology and what doesn't. Um, if you look at what happens in the policy space, we have, I would say there's a public interest technology theme pretty much in every agency, in every legislative space, um, whether you're talking about elections or food or water or medicine, um, you know, health, climate change, you know, energy development. I mean, really across the board, there are, there are uh, technology elements. And if we I forget the I forget if it was Jumana or Alex that talked about it, but if we try to split those things out, there are technology elements and then the cultural or policy elements, I think that that would lead us astray. So there are other ways of thinking about how messy this space can be, but the challenge for Pitt, I think, as an emerging discipline is to recognize that messiness, make it tractable for students so that they can actually learn how to kind of think about those things in an integrated way. And, and sort of function across them without feeling like um, their role is to be a sort of a technology disruptor in a public space or to sort of become a more, you know, politically aware technologist. I think we're really talking about a, a new sort of capacity, a new kind of holistic capacity. And we're learning, I think, as we put our own program together, how to do that. I wasn't watching the time. I don't know if I went over or under, sorry. No, 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 you are, you are good. We are good. And these are important uh, things to uh, talk about. Now, in in the continuation of your conversation, if, uh, if I can ask you further in terms of like looking ahead, um, hopefully to the incoming Biden administration, um, what kind of, um, how do you see issues arising? The things that you are talking about being uh, disruptive, being inclusive, um, how do you intersect uh, when it comes to the social stability and resilience in this case with the current mm -hmm. like the right. yeah. So at pretty much all the all the uh, issue areas I mentioned are, you know, 
things the administration will contend with, but let's just look at um, a, a couple of them. First out will be the pandemic, right? So the, the, the public interest technology issues, which I'm guessing Bob is gonna talk about, so I'm not gonna get into it much at all. Um, but what the thing that I wanna stress here is that the way we think about technology and think about um, managing the pandemic or whatever term we wanna use, um, it's not just about whether we have the right medicines, you know, the vaccines, therapeutics. It's not just about whether we have the right kinds of, you know, digital maps that show us what the different risk exposures are around the country, even though they're very cool. Um, it's not just about um, uh, whether we have tracking apps. There is a there is a fundamental sort of socio-cultural political um, resilience aspect to how we do it that is at least as important, if not more important than the specific technological options that we may develop. And I'm using technologies here in the kind of more traditional sense. So if we develop tracking apps or we develop really, really effective masks or we develop uh, terrific vaccines, but somehow we do it in a way that, that depletes or fails to co actively cultivate social cohesion, they aren't gonna get us very far. Um, and I think that those kinds of considerations um, are have so far been not very well represented in the discussions around the pandemic. And I think that we're seeing some of the results of those things not having been priorities from the beginning. We're seeing a lot of resistance, defiance, confusion um, that are in, in some ways a response to the fact that those were not priorities. And the same thing is going to be true when we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about, you know, energy innovations or talking about specific kinds of climate interventions that may be um, necessary, some of which we're doing research on at, at ASU. Um, these, are, these are issues that are gonna have to kind of be developed not in laboratories and then sprung on the public, but they, they need to be kind of um, brought into uh, um, conversations where we are thinking in terms of how we're building resilience together as well as how we're thinking about solving problems that we might normally think about as being kind of STEMI problems. And uh, I think those challenges are really front and center for this administration uh, in particular. And I'm hoping that they're going to prioritize that in the leadership in different agencies um, in, in their selection of leadership, as well as in how the, the policies are um, designed and implemented. Thank you so much. and. Uh... You also gave me a very good, uh, you know, uh, conversation starter with uh, Bob on this. Um, so I'll, I'll start with you, Bob. So we are, our next speaker is uh, Professor Robert Kugigan uh, of uh, School of Future of Innovation in Society at ASU. Um, Bob was also the founding director of Genome Ethics, Law and Policy in Duke's Institute of uh, Genome Science and Policy. Um, he is the author of The Gene Wars, uh, science politics and uh, the human genome. And um, my first question to you, sir, is um, when we talk about COVID-19 pandemic, the, the present situation, and as we are talking about TIC and how to make it more inclusive, more equitable, more responsive, more complete, uh, how how do you see it just not in the short term the feed graduates uh focusing on or you know addressing this covid issue but this covid 19 post uh periods uh how how, how can feed graduates be ready for this and uh what what where the what, what are the scopes what are the possibilities and maybe some challenges yeah, thank you, Fahim. So, so just focusing for a second on uh, th the area that I work on. I'm a physician who became a molecular biologist and then went into policy. And I think one way to frame what we're trying to do with Pitt is to stop thinking about STEM as an end unto itself, but rather think of uh, technology as a means to an end. And those ends are human ends. And uh, in the area that I work on, biomedical innovation and, uh, and medicine, um, think about it and think about it in the context of the COVID epidemic. Um, the United States has the most robust system for biomedical innovation that's ever existed on the planet. And yet we have horrible outcomes 
in connection with this pandemic. And uh, so how can we explain that this incredible amount of expertise and resources, and we spend more money on healthcare in the United States by a factor of two per person than any other nation on the planet, and yet our health outcomes are worse and we exclude more people out of our system than uh, any other uh, jurisdiction of the rich countries, the OECD countries. And we actually do worse than many other uh, countries that are not OECD members. For example, when um, the World Health Organization ranked health systems uh, a little over a decade ago, actually two decades ago, we came in between Cuba and Costa Rica in, our, uh, in, in the ranking of our health system. And yet we're spending 10 times as much as Costa Rica is per person for health services. So that tells you, wow, we've got a system that is not focusing on outcomes. It must be focusing on inputs. And so that's what we're trying to educate folks about, which is, well, wouldn't it be nice if we focused our technology on actually reaching the outcomes that we intend to achieve? Um, so focusing on healthcare outcomes. Um, so the COVID crisis has really illustrated very, very starkly the inequities in the current system. And it's also illustrated the incredible strengths of the system. I mean, it is totally amazing. Just think of the last week, what has happened the last week. Number one, the Supreme Court is thinking about dismantling a law that we passed a decade ago to include more people in our health system. That's a great thing to do in a pandemic, right? Kick people out of the healthcare system. Um, so that's happened in the last week. We also had the announcement of really optimistic data about a new vaccine. So the technical people have been doing 24 seven, working really, really hard to develop vaccines. And it looks like maybe we will have some vaccines available early next year. Um, so that's, that's a wonderful thing, right? But now we're gonna have to solve the problem. Who's gonna get the vaccine? How's it gonna be distributed? And will it be fairly distributed? And will only people in rich countries get access to it? Those are all questions that are still hanging out there. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the final thing that I'll, I'll raise as, as an illustration is if you compare what's happening with COVID to what happened with another huge epidemic that affects even more people on this planet, hepatitis C, what you see is in the United States, we have drugs that are actually curative. 90 to 95% of people who get hepatitis C can be completely cured. So we have drugs to treat and, and get rid of an illness. And in Egypt, they've actually managed, they had the highest prevalence in the world, and now they are on the verge of eliminating hepatitis C because of these new drugs that have become available since 2012. In the United States, fewer than one in six people who are infected with hepatitis C have actually been treated. So the richest healthcare system that's the most expensive in the world has completely failed to deliver a powerful technology that can eliminate a disease. Why? Because our system is really, really poorly structured. And those are the sorts of issues that we're trying to train our students to think about. How do we design the system? And that's not because the technology doesn't work. That's because our system of paying for things and doing things is not functioning properly. Hi, um, that's it. <laughs> we wanted to hear more on this uh, from you. So um, you actually shared a very strong example of uh, uh, not just focusing on the input, but on the outputs, and then you talked about it and other places. But, but imagine when we are talking about, uh, I'm just thinking if I, if I were a field graduate. So, and uh, first of all, they need, to be, they need to be included within the system. Uh, and then they need to change the system or how do you see some of the, because some field graduates or the people folks, when they see it, they, are, they can be a bit, uh, I, I feel a bit overwhelmed with the things that's kind of going wrong. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether there are some short-term wins and then mid-term and long-term wins when we are addressing this. Yeah, can you quickly shed some light on this? Well, I think we could open this up to everybody, but I want to go back to something that uh, that Alex raised because I think um, she basically said the most important thing that we can say, which is teach skills and get out of the way. 
Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do. I, I'm thinking about the, the master's students that are in our new uh, public interest technology master's program. It's amazing because they all have day jobs. This is very different from teaching a PhD where that's all that the student is doing. These are folks who have day jobs that are related to technology and they actually want to get some intellectual background that provides them, gives them the tools that they can go out and change the way that they do their work in such a way that it reaches the outcomes that they went into their business for. I mean, everybody usually picks an application, picks a, a, a career path because they do want to pay their mortgage, but they actually want to make a difference in the world. And uh, these students are kind of looking for the skill sets that would allow them to make more productive use of technology so that it reaches the ends that they intend to do. So it's a really unusual group of students. And I think we're going to learn as much from our students who are distributed all over the United States. Um, we're going to learn as much from them as they're going to get from us. What we can do is kind of channel that effort and, and create a a skill set and a set of exercises that allow them to be more powerful at the jobs that they're already doing. And I think that's, I think that's probably going to be the kind of ed education that we're trying to do that will be a bit distinctive to PIT compared to your standard PhD or your standard undergraduate education. Thank you so much, Bob. And um, I will be actually, I think I will revisit this question to ask uh, everybody about this, but this is fascinating. Uh, actually, I was uh, taking some notes on this. So at this point, before I go back to some of the other questions that I have, uh, let's uh, look into some of the questions that our audience actually put for us. So I see uh, several ones. Uh, I think first one is uh, for Alex, uh, I think. Uh, so in regard to Agloro's uh, idea of teaching skills instead of helping question, uh, is uh, like, do they even want or need these skills? Or what are the skills you have in mind? Alex. And that gets to a really good starting question is, don't go into places where you're not wanted. Is I mean, that's probably like the, the precursor to all of this is that it isn't just about showing skills. And as Bob said, getting out of the way, it's also treading carefully, being cautious, listening, and then proceeding with proceeding with care. Um, and I think humility is a huge part of this. So when thinking about like teaching skills, like I think humility is like probably the number one skill that we could be teaching our students. Like humility brings ethics, humility brings listening. Um, and in like just in particular, like the ways that the ways that we've been trained as technologists, and when we think about um, building technology, or currently our engineering and computer science um, curricula, like that, there's like an ethics day, and then we move on and we just carry on going. Um, it's because we're not proceeding with humility and thinking about like what we do and what we don't know, and thinking about like who who could potentially be helped, but also who could potentially be harmed from this. Um, so I think I, like if it's particular what skills, it's the skills that are necessary um, to, to, to better whatever scenario that we're in. So it's really hard to say like, what skills should we be teaching exactly? Um, but it's, it's whatever's needed at the moment. So, I mean, obviously if somebody wants water, they don't want to learn how to code. Like that's that like, there's that disconnect in there. Um, you know, if we need healthcare, like we don't need to learn how to code, like those sorts of things. So we're thinking about like hierarchy of demand and hierarchy of needs. Um, and let's take care of like first things first, like let's all, let's let's get basic humanity um, on, on par. And then we could think about this other tech stuff that can make our life easier, but like food and water and healthcare and shelter, um, all of those things are probably more important first than whatever cool tech thing that we all know how to, we all want to learn how to do, or we all know how to teach. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so the second question, actually, it starts with, uh, I think, uh, some reflection, and then we have a couple of questions, and anybody can take it. Um, humanizing the data, that's a great idea. 
if uh, they cannot relate to the data, it does not make sense indeed. So the questions are, how do we make that happen? Especially when the learner never experiences that. For example, how do you make them understand extreme poverty when they never come close to that in real life? Who wants to take this? You wanna? I'll take it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, uh, it's a really good question, but I think that that's a lot of the work that we need to be doing because I think that as we've focused more and more on on big data and the bigness of the data, um, it actually reduced our need and desire to um, to really understand context and to understand where this data comes from and what we don't know. I mean, so Alex was just talking about uh, humility, and I think that big data makes us gives us a is, a, is like a an arrogance booster because you think you have all the answers. I think that we've spent a lot less time um, bringing in new perspectives, challenging our assumptions, making sure that we understand that uh, not everybody looks like us and wants the things that we do and uh, making the time and the space to include those voices and experiences. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I think is, just a uh, fact today is that uh, technologists are creating with the incentive, like the, the, the measure of success is, does everyone on the planet use your thing? And if, if that's how we're gonna think about it, then it is imperative that we know who everyone on the planet is. And if not, then just say it's not for everyone on the planet and make sure that we understand who it's for and how to protect the people who it's not for from the harms that it causes. I think that it has to come from, again, um, you know, humanizing the data and making it personal. What would, what would some of the questions, I mean, we're ego-driven people, right? We're human beings. So what would we fear? What would we, uh, we would fear not being understood or not being seen? and kind of making sure that as students, as uh, practitioners of PIT, we have that in the back of our, of our minds that there are people out there whose lives we absolutely do not understand and, who's as, and the assumptions that we make can be deeply, deeply harmful, not just to them, but to the rest of the world. So I think part, you know, like a huge part is to say, um, let's relearn what the world is made of. Let's relearn, let's get, uh, let's develop a new and warm and small data understanding of the planet and its uh, and the environment that we're in. Thank you. Anybody else? And so you were, you were, yes, you are not muted. Are you? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I want to take that and, and bring it back up a little bit to the policy level, because I think that there's something that we should find about this, which is that all of the, if we're talking about technology development and design, or if we're talking about implementation and use, um, these things are happening within an institutional context. So by institution, I don't mean an organization, although they're there but that there are certain um, rules of the game. There are ways that things work that sort of dictate um, how things will, will happen. Um, and those rules can incorporate ethics and awareness and inclusiveness, or they don't necessarily have to. But I think that one of the traps that we sometimes fall into, not, not just with uh, with Pitt, but with anything that involves public engagement or the idea of publics having any interest at all. So this runs across all policy areas as well, or science in general. Is this notion that we fix it by including people early and often and co everything And one of the things that is just a reality is that when you are in a, a policy position in government, when you're in a position of responsibility, you don't always have the ability to do that in the kind of granular way that we might imagine it. 
um, you, you don't always have a way of checking in with everybody. You don't necessarily have a process for being able to actually contact everybody in the world. And, and that's why I think um, being able to, to build that kind of um, reflexive awareness into how we teach people to function in those kinds of spaces is really important because sometimes there are mechanisms for being able to physically engage people or you know directly engage people. Sometimes there aren't, but when, when they are not there, you need to be able to figure out how to interpret data and a few anecdotes or no, you have to be able to, to project and think about the implications of what you're actually doing for, for real people. Last but not least, I became really interested in finding out, this is when I was in government and started doing research on this stuff. I, I was interested in finding out how much people really wanted to be included because we talk about it a lot. There's a lot in academia about the need to be inclusive and to engage. And so I did research about it. And part of what I discovered is that there are, there are a lot of times when people don't care. They actually don't want to be engaged. They don't want to, they, it's your job, whoever got elected, it's your job who has, you know, who's appointed to fix it. You know, to be responsible, to be accountable to the public or to the publics and to really, and to, to do your job so that they can continue being nurses or teachers or, you know, wait staff at restaurants or, or professors teaching something else and not this. And, um, and I think that that is one of the absolute trickiest pieces of all this, that there is some sort of a, there is constant balancing point between being kind of directly inclusive and being able to somehow um, have that frame of mind, even when you don't have the ability to, to uh, you know, run, run, I'm going to run focus groups about every decision that you make or whatever, when you can't re realistically co-design in a kind of a uh, practical way with everybody. And I, I'm wondering if Alex might have views about this because there's this kind of very micro and very macro aspect to this work. And I think that, that the micro stuff is a little bit easier to think about in terms of classes and curricula, but, but the kind of work that our students are likely to be doing um, maybe at that macro level, and how do we teach them to sort of take that sensibility forward with them? Am I going to respond? Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, you look like you wanted to. That's why. Is that well, okay? Yeah. So I think this is like the moment for me to plug that we can't let go of the arts and the humanities um, because we all stop being human without those lines of thinking. So like as we're defunding the arts and we're defunding humanistic thought and we're piling everything into like STEM education and STEMing everything, um, we we need to not leave, we need to, yeah, we need to not leave behind care, caring for each other, like learning those skills of like inquisitive thought, curiosity, asking questions, not just solving the problem set. Um, and because people do have to make on the ground decisions on their own. Like eat, like for as much as I am all about co-design, I also know that if we co-design everything, we get nothing done because we'll be like moving so, so slowly. Um, and so I think that like my approach to it is that you, somebody has to be in charge. Like even if it is co-design, somebody has to be in charge. And at the end of the day, somebody has to actually make those decisions and the way, and people people also want to feel safe like better co-design is co-designed within some kind of parameter or a structure where you're deciding between certain sets of stuff and not like dumping out the entire sandbox and starting from square one uh, because then nothing gets done and so i guess like on on a macro level i think you're totally right that people need to do their jobs and make decisions um and i think that again, humility and ethics and humanistic thought are ways, things that we should keep teaching um, our students going out into the world it, to help them process better, think better, make better decisions, be more thoughtful. And Fahim, just a, a thought here also. I think there's a methodologic thing that we can in, insert here into how we're teaching our students. And that is, um, th this question is really about how we can get stuck in an office thinking about statistical lives instead of real lives in the real world. And one of the things that um, Lisa and I used to work at this place called the Office of Technology Assessment, which is part of the US Congress. One of the things that I learned there 
was the most powerful methodology that I ever had as a study director at OTA was to actually go out and field trips and go talk to people that were doing the things that we were supposed to be writing about. It's amazing how few people actually do that. And we've brought that into our curriculum. Uh, we're asking all of our students to go out and actually interview some stakeholders about the technology that they're focused on so that they don't just think of this as statistical stuff. It's like real people facing real questions in their real lives. Um, and I think there, there are methodologic things that we can do like that to, to kind of change the norms so that it's not so academic and only focused on publications. I, I totally hear you. Yuvana, you have a comment. Just a quick um, pylon here. I think, you know, violent agreement with um, all of the comments that are happening. I, th I also sort of get um, a, big, a bit anxious when I hear so much of the, I mean, I know this is the, the panel and what we're talking about, but so much sort of responsibility being put on the educators of, um, of PIT or STEM um, because you can be the best educator, the most, you know, the, the, the most inspiring. You can, you can have your, you can create a legion of students who want to go out there and do nothing but wonderful, beneficial things for humanity. But if they are, if they go out there in the world and are confronted with institutions that want none of that, it is impot, like it's not something that just um, the educational system can fix. It has to go beyond that. There has to be you know, a holistic, you know, Elizabeth was talking about, um, you know, reclaiming the idea of tech as a social phenomenon. I think that that is, that means it has to go beyond the walls of academia. It has to go into the workplace. And so what are we also doing? What expectations are we, um, how are we preparing our students for that disconnect? You know, how are we, what can we do to go in and say, unless we can change that environment, which is sort of like saying that, like, if there is a way we can build in, make this required rather than desired, if we can say, no, you don't have a choice and they can't make you not do it. They can't say, no, your ethics don't matter because my KPIs matter more. If there is a way to protect the students once they leave that environment, that, you know, that's the holy grail, I think. Okay. Quick, quick thought. Yeah. Um, so listening to Bob and Alex and now Jumana makes me think that language is really important. Um, and uh, we haven't talked about what our backgrounds are. I'm a political scientist and economist by, by background. So words like public interest actually mean something very specific to me. And it has to do with sort of competition and coalition building within the policy space, to, to put it mildly. And I think that if that's the perspective that people take with them, into these jobs where they have to try to decide how they're gonna, what, what ethical stance they're going to take, right? What are they going to bring if they're small fry in an organization, if they're in a leadership position, what do they, what do, they do? Um, listening to you, I'm thinking that perhaps the language we should be using is public service technology because it just puts you in a different frame of mind. So the frame of mind that it, that it puts you in is that regardless of what role you have in your organization, whether you're someplace that really wants to have that, you know, perspective or not, um, that it, it makes you other looking. It makes you focus on trying to understand how you can be of service and to whom, instead of being able to kind of become complacent that as long as you can figure out what the interests are, you're good. And, um, and, it, and it kind of turns it from being kind of a relationship-based sort of way of thinking about it in, in instead of a methodological um, or analytical based. And I don't know what the rest of you think about that, but um, that public service ethic is something that we've seen make a big difference in the last few years and, uh, and going forward into the, you know, the next federal administration, it's likely to change how governance gets done if that ethic comes back. Um. Do you want to break? Then we have like four minutes left, so we need to also wrap it up. Yes, just a quick response. I think that's really interesting framing, Elizabeth, because I think that um, the, the changing it from interest to service um, uh, it sort of imbues the practitioner with an ownership. It's with a role, with an action, um, rather than just a knowledge. And I think that that is a really interesting um, shift and a really important shift because it puts um, 
the you know the, the the learner in the driver's seat how are you going to it's a it's an active term versus a passive term so i'm all for it okay so we we are actually redefining uh fit uh that's that's uh, that's awesome within within the within an hour that that this is this is very good conversation so when we talk about language when we talk about contextualization then we talked about governance policy makers technologies industry i actually have a question for all of you uh, if you can reflect on this quickly, um, that the globalization of it is just not about U.S. It's just not about OECD. It's about us that we all inherit this planet Earth. So, in terms of globalization of it, now let's be very specific. Like, imagine our program uh, within SU that we are we are we are we just uh, started. Um, what are what are the couple of things that you would like to see, um, each of you, uh, to make sure that we are inclusive in terms of just not US centric, but also outward. Whoever wants to take it first. Well, one thing that I'll observe is that, in fact, um, the online technology, in many ways, it's not the same thing as being in a classroom, and it's not quite as rich an experience and all that. But the big advantage is you can do it from anywhere. Um, and while our first inaugural students in the master's program are coming from all from the US, they're all over the US, but I don't think we have any international students. There's no reason that we can't. And I think the skill sets are at least as relevant, uh, maybe even more relevant um, in countries outside the US. Um, than they are in the U.S. and I, I think the methodology and the and the ways of thinking about emerging technologies are are totally global. Thank you, Bob. I just uh, I can I should I? Yeah, um, I think I mean I think Bob talked about it earlier when he was talking about you know the the dearth of people going out in the field. I think it's just the idea of thinking about the field is a really big one, and we need to go into it. And how are we you know. You don't just include voices by sending out a survey and seeing what people say. So you you do your homework up front. You go into the field. You spend time there, and that field means um, very different places, very far and very removed places. And I think we ought to spend a lot of time thinking about how we can enter them respectfully. Lisa. Uh, yeah. So I would second what was just said by Jamana and Bob. Um, also to note that recruiting, if we're thinking about global um, issues here, recruiting I think is a question. Clearly the people who can't engage in online learning are gonna be excluded by definition. And, um, and I also think that the emergence of the term and people not understanding what it is could be an issue. And third, if we're trying to figure out how to kind of um, embed this, then we may need to think about things besides degree programs. We may need to think about sort of short term weekends, you know, sort of things that are more accessible to, to people that aren't ready for a degree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, closing it out. Um, I think that learning to, together globally helps everybody to learn better. That if we're learning things as a whole, then it isn't just like us looking at them, them looking at us, but we have a lot to share. Um, I think that US based students can learn our own culpability about how the world has gotten to be the way that, that it is and some of the places that we've been at fault for and then not going into this trap of making simple fixes for simple problems that leave everybody feeling good but never ever tackles anything of substance that we could do that all better together learning together thank you so much thank you so much so this is this is very fruitful and like if i end uh, with uh, some of uh, your quotations that nothing about us without us so we need to make sure that we are inclusive. Uh, we are going to reclaim uh, the key technology with that, that just for, that just don't just focus on inputs, but outputs as well. And we need to make sure that we do co-design as we mean it, that we are asking real people real questions and we have policymakers with empathy uh, so that uh, we can definitely make sure that it's inclusive, it's equitable, it's globalized, and it's definitely also contextualized. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for this conversation. Um, I wish we could uh, we could talk more, and uh, hopefully uh, we would be having the conversation offline as well. Um, and uh, uh, have a have a great rest of your day, and uh, um, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.